path for students, right? So why are we just talking about students from high school and not somebody who's returning or looking for a little bar shop? Dawn, Dawn, I'm curious. <laughs> yeah, Park, um, because they're not the main part of the revenue. Uh, yeah, there's not enough they're of not them. They're not the main revenue stream. Yeah. Um, I, uh, although Park, we do actually have a program at my institution uh, for called New Resources Students for students who are uh, over the age of 23 and haven't received a bachelor's degree that would like to come back to college or enter college. Um, I think definitely thinking about, and I don't want to open a, another can of worms, um, but <laughs> definitely something we haven't touched upon either was uh, the Black Lives Matter movement last year and um, talking about uh, systemic racism and institutional racism. And I think those are conversations that colleges also need to begin to have. Um, in terms of testing, I think a lot of colleges have realized that this year they can no longer uh, stand behind this idea of prerequisites and testing. And, and the UC system in particular um, has has a lot of challenges for this year. And I'm, I'm curious to see what they decide to do coming out of it. Um, for uh, AP and SAT has been called out a couple of times for um, being a for-profit institution. Uh, College Board had a $2.1 billion revenue last year. Um, their CEO makes millions of dollars. Um, and so what does that mean for our students who are barred from entering a certain college because of four hours on a Saturday um, that determines whether or not they get access to learning. Um, I think AP and SAT may be going away um, and students will find other opportunities to, and colleges will have to adapt and learn how to deal with those consequences and how to reshape their narrative. Um, I think some models to really look at are liberal arts colleges. We've been doing this um, actually, liberal arts colleges were the, are the oldest colleges in the U.S., and so we've been doing it for hundreds of years. Um, but for example, at my institution, testing is never a priority. We've been test optional for 13 years, and we're still able to admit students. Uh, we admit students based off of fit. We admit students based off of their interest in their college. Um, we admit students based off of community. Um, and so those are things that larger campuses or larger universities may start to begin to think about as well, definitely in relation to what Park was saying in terms of satellite campuses as well. I think that's something that um, colleges need to start to discuss. Um, I think there's a question about um, technology and I wanted to provide an example. Um, I think this last spring where we, when we just went virtual, there was a lot of problems with AP testing um, and students that didn't have Wi-Fi on at home. Um, and so certain high schools were able to contact um, cell phone providers and set up temporary cell towers in their parking lot to allow for students to drive to camp, drive to drive to the parking lot and take their tests uh, in the parking lot in their cars. Um, my younger siblings just graduated college, uh, high school last year, um, and they had a similar experience where they had roadblocks because they were in Taiwan attending an international high school and they had to take their AP test at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, and that was not something that the college board or colleges thought about um, before pre-pandemic. Um, and so I think those are conversations that we need to have as well. Um, yeah, back to you, Kim. Yeah, so we have a little uh, Q&A going on in the chat here, but there is a couple of things brought up. One was, um, is there any downside to um, some of these new tools that we're hearing about today, like Twitch and some of the other ones. Um, I don't know, Gary, if you wanna just touch on that. I know you've answered it already. Sure, I'm, um, I was just looking at Debbie's comment about you know, faculty being challenged. One of the issues that I've raised at my institution, and I wrote a white paper on this for the Association for Applied and Clinical Sociology, is that um, again, the, the metrics the, the stated goals of institutions are misaligned with the actual metrics that they're using. And so, you know, this idea of recruiting faculty who are, who are able to do this, not every faculty member is gonna be able to do this, right? I mean, nor should every faculty member be able to go on to Twitch and do these things. But, you know, if, if, what, if all you care about is people publishing in academic journals, 
and getting grants to help your ranking and fund graduate students in labs, then do that thing. But don't say you're about something else and then only reward this other thing that is the old academic model. Nothing wrong with that model. And, but you're, there are plenty of faculty, especially younger faculty who are looking for work or are coming up who want more than that. They're purpose driven, they're mission driven. They want a sense of value in their work and not just a sense of you know, publication and output. And quite frankly, the model of academic journals is going away. I know more faculty are like, you want me to review something for free while you make money off of it? And that's gonna take time away from the things I wanna be doing? No, thank you. So I think that there's this larger ground shift among faculty, especially younger faculty, to move away from that. And schools are gonna be caught out if the, the, and this is a faculty prerogative, so I'm blaming the faculty, if they don't keep up with that cultural change. And institutions, if they care about only the you know, USB or US News and World Report rankings, if that's all they care about, then they're gonna have a hard time really embracing and staying relevant beyond brand. And mm -hmm. that's where I see that schools need to take a broader point of view to be able to reward and retain, to recruit, retain, reward and retain, I should say recruit, reward and retain those people who are good at this and then deploy them to the maximum ability possible in those directions while other faculty who may not care about it can do the work that they're most passionate about as well which is employee experience and why schools need to adopt the faculty experience perspective as well as a student experience. Right. Well said, Gary. Um, well, we have uh, certainly talked about a lot today. We only have a few minutes left. Um, I think I just wanna, I just wanna kind of end by saying we, we have a lot more conversations to have. We have a lot more to learn. And I think that I appreciate you all throwing out there so many great things that we as designers and planners and uh, you know, just design professionals can think about as we move forward and as we see how this shifts, not only this year and next year as we go back to campus, but how we think of how this is gonna be over the next five to 10 years. Um, it'll be really interesting to maybe do a follow-up to this in a year from now and see how much more of these things that we're seeing. But you've all been able to uh, explain to us and share with us your examples of how certainly technology is, you know, they have a seat at the table now. And I think that's a very, very important thing that we all agree is essential going forward. It sounds like experience design, which I've, I've heard a lot of architects, you know, using that model going forward, that's just going to become commonplace. And Duan Duan, it's been really enlightening to hear from your perspective to see how we should be thinking a little bit more about um, how the students are getting to campus and not only that, but how important it is for folks in, in the administration and your positions that, you know, we can't design more and we can't help um, with capital programs if we don't have students and your, survive, your survivability uh, was enlightening to me of, of how uh, campuses are approaching thinking of that uh, way in advance. And so I, I hope that folks have, have picked up on some of those important topics as we go forward. Um, so each of you, I don't know if you have a couple just uh, ending remarks that we can give people back their, their time for the day and move on. Anything? I guess I'll go, I guess I'll go first. I, I would just encourage people to take that systems point of view. You know, Dwan Dwan and Chad said staff, absolutely staff across, you know, areas of the organization, including facilities management. People in facilities management typically are likely, are more likely to see students than faculty are, quite frankly. Most faculty see students in the classroom and that's it. Students see people who do the work on the facilities far more. And so when we're thinking about the broader stakeholder perspective, we really gotta take that 30,000 foot view so we can drill down to those specific touch points and design those experiences around those touch points to create the better overall experience across the ecosystem. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, students are a lot more aware of higher education in the US and colleges and institutions than colleges and institutions may believe so. Um, students are definitely watching the steps um, of what these colleges and universities are doing. And um, that is a determining factor on their uh, application or retention in that college. I think colleges and 
universities tend to be slow in terms of response and collaboration and working with one another. Uh, we're a slow organization in terms of getting anything done because we have so many committees. Uh, and I think we really need to step that up and change that similar to changing that academic model, changing that college model. Um, what can we do to better collaborate between the offices, between staff and faculty so we can work towards um, keeping up with this super fast paced society that we find ourselves in now. I, I like the point about super fast society. And so I'm always encouraging, I, you know, I'll be the first technologist to tell you that something is not a great application for technology. It should just be a white box or something, right? And, and those are moments where I'm trying to think and I encourage us all to think about ways we can lower the barrier to discovery and create creative solutions. Um, I think that's the moment right now. We shouldn't be building brand new, well, I don't know, maybe there are times where it is, but, but I, I encourage people to get away from, uh, in this moment, building a brand new building with new classrooms and instead thinking about, can we try something? Can we break something down? Can we try things a bunch of different ways? Or can we look at ways in which we're already prototyping? Um, uh, this is a really good moment for that level of thinking. Um, and then also, I think Duan Duan started us off and hinted at some really powerful tools of, uh, you know, simple gap analysis. Let's stop thinking about what's available to us right now and start thinking about 10 years from now, what do we want to be? Where do we want, want to go? Um, now look around in a campus that is, we see with completely different eyes for, for where we are right now and start working backwards uh, and filling in those gaps on how we get from here to there. Or those are just so many opportunities right now um, for that. And all we need to do is talk to each other a little bit differently to get there. Great. I wanna thank you all, Gary, Duan Duan Park, uh, very enlightening. I thank you for taking the time today and um, look forward to seeing uh, how all of these things help you all in your, your daily life going forward in the industry. Um, so thank you all. I want to turn it over to Debbie McDonald to wrap it up for us. And um, there you go, Debbie, are you there? Thanks. Super panel. I want to thank you all. This has been very fantastic. Um, what we try to do in BSA SCUP is just explore topics that we think will be really helpful and relevant to our higher ed uh, institutional partners and the advocates and consultants that work with them. So this has been eye-opening for me. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, please do look on the BSA uh, and SCUP websites for upcoming events. We do have one on February uh, 17th um, on healthcare, uh, from healthcare perspective, from an engineering perspective. And then we'll also have a case study from Lehigh University and HGA Architects. Uh, there is also the upcoming SCUP conference, March 17th to 19th. Um, where we will continue to explore, um, you know, issues in higher ed post COVID because we all want to there's there's not a lot of benchmarking so please do look for upcoming sessions and look at the SCUP website also for the upcoming SCUP conference and we look forward to seeing all of you again soon. Thanks for taking time out of your day to, uh, to be with us. Thank you all.